Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of Embracing the Journey. It's been a while now since the uh, harvest of Cicero, and as you can tell, my real cheap hillbilly <laughs> sign here for Glory Knox fell over. On this episode, we're going to talk about Glory Knox. We're going to see uh, how did I feel they performed in the field. We're going to talk about three takeaways that I feel you and myself need to learn from the harvest of Cicero. We're also going to take a status check on my season as it stands right now. And we're going to hit the field for a last second stand placement looking forward to the end of the year where I really think something's going to die out of that tree. Stay tuned. You're watching Embracing the Journey. Smallacre Hunting's 2018 Embrace the Journey is brought to you in partnership with Real World Wildlife Products, Radix Trail Cameras, and Treehopper LLC. Hey guys, so one of the questions that I got asked um, about my hunt was how did I think the Glory Knox performed? I want to be honest with you guys. The Glory Knox performed exactly like I would hope any Glory or any Illuminated Knock would. Um, the fact that it was a Glory Knock did not change much about the way I hunt. It didn't impact my hunt much. It performed as it's supposed to, just as my old Illuminated Knox did. Um, now granted, I've shot about four different brands of Illuminated Knox. I've had issues with at least one in every single brand. That's not why I chose Glory Knox. The reason why I chose Glory Knox were for those moments where I have to disengage the knock. They truly perform amazing, but how did they perform in the hunt? It was very early when I shot Cicero. It was still extremely light out. Honestly, I was shocked I could actually make out the light from my stand, but it was clear as day in the stand. The picture doesn't quite do it justice, but I could see it from the stand, and when that arrow blew through that deer, it was probably at about 13, 14 yards from me. So, you know, you're near 30 feet away if not a touch over and I could see that knock it was still lit even though it entered that deer passed through that deer entirely and slammed into the ground shoving that arrow about six inches into the ground and it did not disengage I found it then about two hours later it was probably a little bit longer after um, waiting on pops to get there and the glory knock was still fully lit I grabbed it disengaged it extremely easy just as it was advertised. So really, Glory Knox so far for me, their design beats everything out there. The ease of shutting them off beats everything out there. And I personally, I can't attest for everybody or can't say for everybody, but I have not had any issue at all with them. And I recommend them for what it's worth. Not getting paid by them, but hey, Glory Knox, if you're watching this, reach out to me. Maybe you don't have to pay me for uh, this free advertising, but maybe you can throw me a pack and uh, we can do a giveaway for all my subscribers and listeners. Now, let's move to a segment of this Embracing the Journey where we're actually going to head to the Swamp property where we're starting to have a good number of bucks show up. We actually, at, there's a scrape at the one edge of the field that's a good inventory spot. We had some really excellent bucks show up. Um, but there's a section of this property all the way down on the edge that I really wanted to try to get up. Um, there is not a good entrance and exit to that point yet. However, we are working on it as the video is going to allude to. Um, we hunt that edge very sparingly and we only can hunt it on the one side where really the only decent tree is along that tree line, but we found one more and the entrance and exit is going to lead us to only probably hunt this stand two to three times this entire year. And it's only going to be if we have a buck tag in our pocket but let's hit that tree and explain why and kind of touch on a little bit what i did and i'll share some video uh, some pictures at the end of the uh brushing in job that we attempted to do with some cedar hey guys so quick little mid-season video here we are at the swamp property as you can probably tell let me pan back we are over the beans this is that big field on the southern edge of the beans here and there's a access road just a dirt 
ag access road right down here. And it is a pain to get here. We don't really have a good access. We're actually going to talk to the landowner about coming in off of the easement that he has from the other side. And But that probably won't be this year. We're hanging this stand with thoughts of late season in particular, but also once or twice before firearm season. If you remember, we lose this place in firearm season. And the landowner hunts some pretty sparingly. He's got some other guy who comes in and walks everywhere, like I said. So they really, really decrease the deer activity, but then it usually picks back up once we let it alone for a week or two, if we can keep people off of here, terrorizing it. But this is a spot that I've been looking at for years, and I was always hesitant because I can't get real high. I'm actually about where the platform will be, and I'm, I'm maybe 10, 12 feet off the ground. It's in a willow tree along the ditch line here, but it puts me along this southern edge where they walk, and there's actually a couple really big uh, corridors leading out of the bedding sanctuary 15 yards to my east and 25 yards to my west and those are where two of the biggest scrapes pop up every year along this path so what we're going to do is on a proper wind where two people can hunt out here one person with a buck tag is going to hit this tree another person's going to hunt more of an observational spot maybe shoot a doe but the reason why we need that other person is so that they can drive the truck down this access road because this person's most likely going to get pinned in this tree. There's a couple spots out here in the beans that we didn't overseed like I wanted to, just didn't have time, but I found a bag of oats in my basement today from this year that I forgot I had. So we're going to spread that. We're supposed to get 50s and 60 degree temps here for a while, so those will be good until a real hard weather hits and then those oats will most likely die off but it'll give them something green out there by a couple stand locations we may sprinkle some out here in front of this stand but this stands primarily being hung for old or for late season but the reason why i'm making this video is you got to be willing to adjust and follow your gut my gut's been telling me i need to get to the southern edge there's a better tree actually on the other side of the access road if we grant easement or we get easement we'll be able to hunt out of an oak tree 60 70 yards onto the property from our parking spot and it is on the other side of the ditch and it'll be a much quicker access. Access here is going to be across this bean field. We're going to be laying down scent across that bean field but we're going to come in and come directly in. That way any deer that comes out of either of these trails has to walk this edge to cross our ground scent and we'll actually blow back out towards the field. Let me see if I can show you. As you can tell, really, really big bog swamp type setup over there. A lot of buck bedding. And uh, that's what we're trying to capitalize on. Pops has two buck tags because he earned his urban one, and this one is in an urban zone, amazingly. So we're going to actually be cutting some cedar trees. I got some cedar trees on the other side of the ditch here. And you'll notice we don't have much cover. But we're going to hang cover in that tree up here. We're going to hang cover on this stuff here. We're going to zip tie everything up. We've got a dead branch over here by the tree and we'll probably zip tie some stuff down behind us as well to where we only have about two, maybe three good shots, but could be two or three good shots on a really good buck. So as I mentioned in the lead into this video, there are three major things. Now there are a lot of things I'm learning from the hunt from Cicero. Um, and I've discussed those with you guys already some, but there are three really big things that I think all of us can learn, especially given the time frame of the hunt. So number one, greens can really be king early season depending on the animal. Right now at the swamp property, the alfalfa is getting hammered and at new 22, this bad boy was hitting that clover chicory plot like it was going out of style. The end of September and even into October, once I pulled the cards, October 2nd, he was walking along the clover. He was actually strolling with a, another big deer. Hopefully, you guys all see very soon. Number two, security is crucial. Yes, not only did we provide him with food, yes, there's water present, and yes, there's bedding cover. But security is not necessarily given by any of those three things, and it's not automatically given when you give them good bedding. 
he had great security in that we made it a point to stay away from that property and there are areas of that property we only go into once or twice a year and that's to sculpt them better for them for betting purposes. Even when I arrive at the property, we, we actually went there September 15th and worked on the property. We had to do fertilization of a lot of the plots. We had to check cameras. We had to spray and mow a couple sections. We overseeded some sections and we hung one stand and we hung some no trespassing signs. When I arrived, I clapped, I made noise, I the whole way back. That way if any deer, and he very well was betting in one of the three locations we know he liked to bed, he could slip out or he could hunker down. And either is a success for them, and that betting is tabbed as a success if they walk away with that encounter with their life. Security is crucial. Thing number two, or number three, totally messed that up. But number three, entrance and exit. I cannot stress enough, the best location to hunt is not always the best location to hunt. It's not always the smartest thing. The swamp property. I would love to be able to hunt that southern edge of that property every single time I go out there. But one, it's not smart because the wind's not always going to be my favor. But entrance and exit is terrible to down there. Not only do I have to go way out of my way, walk the entire perimeter of the property, but if I'm hunting anything except for that, that uh, east side, entrance exit I'm gonna ask deer to cross my path and that's something I don't want to have to do unless I absolutely have to and it's crunch time the entrance exit to hunt Cicero on that clover chicory plot is almost foolproof the only outside chance that I bust a deer that I may shoot is if they're bedding in the overgrown dirt track they don't seem to like to do that much and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact over time that became a real dirt ridden high sand content area. There's not many weeds, there's not much grass that likes to grow out in that. It's not really thick and it doesn't get really tall yet. As the saplings take over, I think that's gonna become a bigger issue with me and I'm actually possibly formulating a plan to talk to that uh, landowner to allow me to, I'm gonna come up with some kind of a creative way whether I wanna plant, um, well, I don't really know, and we'll discuss that in a future episode. That's not the point of this, but entrance and exit was crucial. I took my time, and as you heard me explain in the video or on Habitat Podcast, I literally hit the fence, which is about 20 yards from the stand, and I bet you from the time I climbed over that fence to actually being on stand and getting the bow and arrow up was easily 20 to 25 minutes. I took my time excruciatingly because I knew there was a really good chance he was very close and I didn't want to blow it. Those are the three things that I feel you and I need to learn from Cicero. like there's green over there more. 
more so than not, but it's pretty sparse and, and hit or miss. So those brassicas over there should get massive because they're going to be sucking up all the nutrients. On the other side of that, there's another thick patch, and then there's a trail that runs along the pond there. So what I'm hoping is those deer will look down from the south side of the pond out in front of me and come my way. Um, it's an observational sit unless something decides to come over to this food which the wind will be in their favor, so I'm facing west. I got a north, northeast wind, so it'll just miss them. And then I'm hoping deer hook around the south side of the pond because then they can enter the food with the wind in their favor of their nose. I've also had deer oftentimes come across the road and shoot over, so, and there's bedding behind me. They could find a crossing. Um, it's all just luck of the draw where they decide to go on the food. This pocket is the farthest closest to the road, so I'd like to have been another 50 yards up on another stand, but first time in, I'm after a doe only. I don't have a buck tag. I didn't want to push it, so even just that 50 yards would have put me on a couple more crossings that come from the east off the property. And there's a camera over there that gets a lot of daytime pictures in the setting sun time frame. So. Oh, we got, we got, we got, we got turkeys coming. It's uh, 5.45 and we put eyes on our first deer. There's actually three or four of them. They're all the way to my northeast behind me in that fallow field that's just overgrown with grasses. It's too saturated.
pops would have set the blind. He'd had a shot at him. I don't know if he'd want to shoot him, but that doe that was out there ran back in kind of my way, but towards the road when he walked out. I'm hoping she came this way enough to where if she decides to come back north, she comes right up here in front of me. I still got about 20 minutes of light. He keeps looking back behind him though, so I have a feeling she's still back there. Tell you what though, this is fun. Finally, guys, I want to take a minute and express to you one of the things that at the Homestead property, Pops has been illustrating perfectly is if you don't have a constant source of water on your property, doesn't have to be pretty, doesn't have to look natural, but putting a watering hole in, the deer will use. You're actually seeing photos right now of the food plot behind my parents' house at the homestead property. Remind yourself, this is only about an eight to nine acre parcel of uh, woods back there. I grew up on this. I've shot some amazing bucks back there, but it really has always been just a doe factory. But the does love using that watering tank. The bucks use it too, but the does are the ones that live on that property. And it seems like every single day they're hitting that plot and they're hitting that watering hole. There's nights where there's 8 to 12 deer in that food plot, gorging themselves, drinking, and then bedding. So if you don't have water on your property and you think, I can't put in a watering hole, I don't have the money to get a backhoe in there, I don't have the resources to do all that. If you've got time and you're willing to visit it at least once a month and keep water in it, or if it's close enough to your house like Pops did, he ran a hose to it and he literally doesn't have to leave the house. He just turns it on and let it run for a little while, fills it up, shuts it off. It's the perks of micro properties, I guess you could say. That's all for embracing the journey this week. Hopefully you've enjoyed it, and uh, hopefully I'll be bringing to you a harvest video when I earn my urban buck. I'm gonna hit the property actually tomorrow, making this on Monday, October, of course, it's covered. October 22nd, going to be hitting the stand the next couple of days, but I'm hoping to get this video up here this week. So by the time you're watching this, I may have already announced on social media that I've downed a doe. Fingers crossed. I probably just jinxed myself, so it won't happen. But just in case, I'll bring it up now. God bless, guys. This is Ty, Small Gear Hunting. Good luck out there. Thanks for watching this episode of Embracing the Journey. If you could do me a favor, please like, subscribe, click that little bell on YouTube so you get notified every time I upload a new video. Be sure to swing over to the Facebook page and the website, subscribe to the email. Remember, I don't blast a ton of emails your way, maybe a half dozen a year. Thanks again for watching, guys, and stay tuned for the next time on Embracing the Journey.